Good morning, scholars. Today we're going to continue our way through Farr's Homeric Greek, a book for beginners, by starting in on lesson 16. Here we will discuss the three voices that a Greek verb can take, active, middle, and passive. We'll also discuss the nature of deponent verbs, that is verbs that have middle or passive forms with active meaning. Okay, so here we go. Now there are three voices in that a Greek verb can assume, the active, the middle, and the passive. The active voice represents the subject as performing the action of the verb. Luo, I wash. Luo, I wash. Under action is included being, as in he hodos makraisten. He hodos makraisten. The way is long. Now, active verbs can be either transitive or intransitive. The action of a transitive verb is directed immediately upon an object, as tupto ton paida. Tupto ton paida. I strike the boy. The object of a transitive verb is always put in the accusative. Hence, ton paida, tupto, ton paida, tupto. Ton paida being the accusative singular of pais. Intransitive verbs. Smythe 1707. The action of an intransitive verb is not directed immediately upon an object. The action may be restricted to the subject as I'll go, I'll go, I am in pain, or it may be defined by an oblique case or by a preposition with its case as in I'll go to spodas, I'll go to spodas. I have a pain in my feet, or apiketo es ten pollen. Apiketo es ten pollen. He arrived at the city. Smythe 1708. Many verbs are used in the active voice both transitively and intransitively. So in English we say turn move, and change, both transitively, as in, I turn the screw, I move the car, I change my ways, and intransitively, simply, I turn, I move, I change. Now, um, let's review first the personal endings of the active, which we've already seen. These are including... Um, they're on the left, they're represented somewhat abstractly in Smythe as he represents them at six, 462, section 462. But on the right, we have them as they manifest in the primary tenses. And these are the endings that we saw attached to the active forms of the present and the future. So, O, A, S, A, Omen. Ete use. And as we saw a while ago, the duels are quite sim uh, simple. Eton, eton, the second person duel, you two, and the third person duel, those two. So, o, es, a, omen, ete use, and then eton, eton. Contrast these with the middle endings, the personal endings of the middle, and you see very clearly um, on the left, Smythe's representation, my, sai, tai, ston, ston, meta, ste, ntai. And so, uniting those with the thematic vowel, we have oh my, si, where, you, where we will see a phonetic change. Etai, ometa, 
Esther, and Ontai. And then the dual Eston, Eston. So these are the endings that uh, are attached to the middle, and we'll see that they are shared or have are used also uh, to express the passive. So, what is the middle voice? The middle voice shows that the action is performed with special reference to the subject. So, lu oma, lu mai, lu mai, I wash myself, as opposed to luo, I wash, say, Tom Paida, the boy. So, lu omai, I wash myself. The middle represents the subject as doing something in which he or she is interested. He may do something to himself, for himself, or he may act with something belonging to himself. So Smythe goes on, his section uh, describing the middle is quite enjoyable to read in all of its details. So I'll just highlight a few of the spe uh, specifications he makes. He talks in terms of the direct reflexive middle, which represents the subject as acting directly on himself. Self is here the direct object, unexpressed. So, with verbs expressing external or natural acts as verbs of the toilet. So, ale pestai, to anoint oneself, ale pestai, lustai, to wash oneself, lustai, komestai, to adorn oneself, komestai, stepanustai, to crown oneself, stepanustai, gymnastai, exercise oneself, gymnastai. The direct reflexive idea is far more frequently conveyed by the active with a reflexive pronoun, and we'll see those later. Um, he describes this at 1723. And then 1717b, the part affected may be added in the accusative. So, epaisato ton meron. Epaisato ton meron. He smote his thigh. Ton meron, his thigh, or the thigh. But you, in Greek, can get away with using the article ton to have this personal pronoun, um, or possessive pronoun, significance. Epaisato ton meron. So as opposed to the, or in distinction to the direct reflexive middle, we have the indirect reflexive middle described at Smythe 1719. The indirect reflexive middle represents a subject as acting for himself, with reference to himself, or with something belonging to himself. So self is here the indirect object. So porizdasthai is to provide for oneself. Porizdasthai, whereas porizdain, porizdain is simply to provide. Pulatasthai is to guard against, whereas pulatain is simply to keep guard. Hyrestai in middle is to choose or take for oneself, whereas high rain is simply active to take. Par ekestai is to furnish, and so that verb occurs when Herodotus is giving an account of the contingents of ships at the Battle of Artemisia. Par ekestai, they supplied you know, 80 ships. Whereas parkane is simply active to offer or to present. So this is the indirect reflexive middle where you do something with something belonging to oneself or with reference to oneself. At 1726, Smythe uh, characterizes the reciprocal middle. He says, with a dual or plural subject, the middle may indicate reciprocal relation. So with verbs of contending, conversing, questioning, replying, 
greeting, embracing, etc. The reciprocal middle is often found with compounds of dia. So this first example, hoi athletai egon is don to. The athletes contended with one another. The athletes contended. Or, second example, katastantes emakonto. When they had got into position, they fought, i.e. fought with one another. And then third example, ania andri dialegonto. They conversed man with man. They conversed with one another, man to man. Or, okay. So, um, that's another reciprocal middle, and I think that's kind of what's going on in our makistai in the opening part of the Iliad. So uh, you also have the middle can be used causatively, but it shares this function with the active, as we'll see. The causative middle denotes that the subject has something done by another for himself. So ego gar se tauta amen, for I had you taught this. Ego gar se tauta amen. I had you taught this. Or, um, para te testai sit, sit don, sit don, to have food served up. So, uh, but this form, force does not belong exclusively to the middle. We see in 1711, uh, Smythe describes the causative active. The active may be used of an action performed at the bidding of the subject. So, kiros, Tabasilea ka katekausen, katekausen. Cyrus burnt down the palace, i.e., he had it burnt down. Kiros tabasilea katekausen. And so too with verbs like apoktenen, to put to death, to have put to death, thoptain, to bury, to have buried, okodomain, to build build a house, paideuen, to instruct, to have instructed, anakeruptein, to publicly proclaim, to have publicly proclaimed. So often the, addict, the active will carry this sense. So um, Smythe gives you some good examples at 1728 of the difference between the active and the middle of verbs. So, as contrasted with the active, the middle lays stress on conscious activity, bodily or mental participate on the conscious activity, the bodily or mental participation of the agent. In verbs that, thus, in verbs that possess both the active and the middle, you have buleuestai, middle, which means deliberate, whereas buleuen simply means to plan. Stathman, the active, means to measure, whereas the middle, stathmastai, means to calculate. Skopein, mean, the active, means to look at, but skopestai means to consider. Ekestai means to cling to, whereas ekein simply means to have or to hold. Pauestai means to cease, that is, to stop oneself, whereas pauen means to stop, like he stopped the bicycle. The force of the middle often cannot be rep reproduced in translation, and in some cases it may not even have been felt by the Greeks themselves. So it's very subtle, but when you look at the full entry in your Liddell and Scott, you will see that very often uh, he does make very plain and designate the difference between the word being used in an active form or in the middle form or in the passive form. Okay, the passive voice. The passive voice represents the subject as acted upon. So we have eotun versus eotunto, epion versus epionto. They pushed. They were pushed, et othun, et othun ton. They struck, they were struck, et paion, et paion ton. 
So we have the passive in English, so it's pretty not hard to understand this. The passive was developed from the middle. With the exception of some futures and the aorist, the middle forms do duty as the passives. So hiretai is takes for oneself, chooses, is chosen. Can be both the middle, he chooses, but also he is chosen. So the same form can be used either in the middle sense or a passive sense. Kekutai has poured itself can also been be has been poured. And then he notes in Homer, there are more perfect middles used passively than other middle tenses. So Homer, he likes to use perfect middles in a passive sense, as we'll see. Monroe, uh, in section eight, expresses this, I think, clearly in a slightly different way. He points out that Greek has no passive endings distinct from those of the active and middle. It is desirable, therefore, to speak not of passive forms, but of the passive meaning or use of a form. We'll see as we uh, look at the forms of the passive that really the tip off of the passive is in the uh, suffix that comes before the ending rather than in the ending itself because as Monroe has just said here the passive has no endings distinct from those of the active in the middle the tip off will be in the suffix right in front of the ending okay so finally we have these things called deponent verbs which if you've studied Latin you're kind of comfortable with but as in all things Greek it's a little more complex in Greek <coughs> so we're looking at section, subsection C here of 356 in Smythe. He says, uh, deponent verbs have an active meaning, but only middle or middle and passive forms. So it's a middle or passive form with an active meaning. Okay. Now, if, an, if, it's, a, if it's aorist has a middle form, the deponent is called a middle deponent. If it's aorist has a passive form, the deponent is called a passive deponent. Deponents usually prefer the passive to the middle forms of the aorist. So uh, we'll go on this a little deeper on the next slide. So middle deponents, this is Smythe 810, deponent verbs whose aorists have an active or middle meaning with middle forms. So an active or middle meaning with middle forms are called middle deponents. The aorist passives of such verbs, when it occurs, has a passive force. So thus you have ideaomai, which is accuse, I accuse you of extortion, versus etiasamen, this is the first aorist, he was accused, but since the aorist form is middle, it qualifies as a middle deponent, whereas the passive form, etiatein, etiatein, was accused, I was accused. So you see the, that you have a middle form of the present, a middle form of the aorist, which tells you it's a middle deponent, and then a passive form that does carry passive uh, sense. As opposed to a passive deponent, whereas wherein a deponent verb whose aorists have a passive form, but active or middle meaning are called passive deponents. As bulomai, wish, but ebuletein. The aorist carries the same active meaning, I wished, but it has a passive form. The future is usually middle in form. Most passive deponents express middle action of some, mental action of some sort. And this is admittedly a little confusing in the abstract, but when you get down to reading text, um, if you're careful to watch your principal parts and such, uh, and to read your full uh, dictionary entries, you will not have much trouble with this. Okay. Now, the principal parts of deponent verbs are going to be a little uh, different 
than what we saw earlier when we were just looking at the principal parts of uh, regular non-deponent verbs. But the principal parts of deponent verbs, you're going to have a present, a future, a perfect, and a aorist indicative. Both first and second aorist are given if they occur. So our first example is of a passive deponent, that is where the aorist form is going to be passive. So we have bulomai, bulesomai, our future, babuleme, babulemai, our perfect, and then ebuletein, our aorist, which has a passive form, which makes it a passive deponent. Then, uh, as an example of middle deponent, we have gignomai, become, genesomai, our future, gegenemai, our perfect, but then egenomain, egenomain, which is a second aorus, but you see it's a middle endings, so this is a middle deponent. And then you have something like ergasdomai, ergasomai, ergasomai, that's your future, ergasamein, that's our first aorus, ergasamai, that's our perfect, and then ergasdein. So here we have both a middle uh, aorus and a passive aorus, so that passive aorus will have the passive sense, whereas uh, the middle formed aorus will have the active sense of the uh, deponent verb itself. So ergasdomai is to work, ergasomai will work, ergasamein, I worked, ergasmai, I have worked, but ergasdain, I was worked. Okay. So there's my hero, Mr. Herbert Weir Smythe, uh, 1857 to 1937. <sighs> blessed man and blessed book. Many thanks to that great man. Okay. Uh, again, uh, I encourage you all to accompany these lectures paging through your smile so you get oriented in that text because that will be your master text in understanding, maintaining, and uh, really growing your Greek. Keep working hard. Don't be intimidated by it. Um, just stick with this series and we'll go deeper and deeper into it. And in uh, two or three years, you'll have a nice little basis of knowledge. Okay. Have a great day, and thank you for being interested. Bye-bye.